He came, the same man, to Jesus by night. Now he's coming to find out how to fit it, how to get fit into this. He's coming, his purpose is to find out how to fit it in, fit himself into this great life that's to come. Isn't it interesting how this all kind of fits in? <laughs> I never did preach a sermon like this in 61 years, month after next, when I began. See, he's coming to find out how to get fit in here and fit it for the skies. Isn't this simple? But it's rich, isn't it? Now he said, he came to Jesus by night and Jesus said to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Oh, he's finding out the first procedure in the fitting business. He's finding out the requirement of getting fit for the sky. He said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, that's fit, getting fit for eternity. And this wise man, this ruler of the Jews, when he heard Jesus say this, let's see the next verse. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He don't understand how this is all going to fit in. But it does. Yes, it does. Can he enter in the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now the first time he said he can't see the kingdom. I want you to know this fitting in is seeing. Not the glass eye. Well, that fit in right well there, didn't it? Oh, this is serious. And this is precious. This is exciting. This is helping us. Because since Jesus left, there's been only a few ever been in the fitting business for this. He's never found many people that are willing to fit themselves for the sky. Only a few. It requires a lot of giving up and giving over, doesn't it? It requires a lot of just surrendering over. He said, you can't see the kingdom till we're born again. He said, now the new birth, you see, requires repentance and confession yes. of sin. Yes. That yes. is all in the fitting business. Conviction that we need to get fit for the sky. We have to see that we're a sinner, lost. We've got to see the hardness of our heart. When I preached about where Jesus said, yet your heart is yet hardened, this son, a very precious servant of God, and has worked hard and labored much in prayer and obedience, told me there at the Nazarene Church in Margate, Florida, he said, my heart is hard. And here he's been striving and been pressing toward the mark for the prize ever since I found him a long time ago. Thank you, Jesus. And I thought how wonderful a heart he has, and he thinks that he believes his heart to be hard, and if his heart is hard... What about many hearts? Because here, here's a tender man. Here's a, a man of capability, a man of diplomacy, a man of honesty, a man of integrity, a man of perseverance, a man of learning, a man of understanding, a man of compassion. And he felt when I got through, he said, it's me who preached to. I have a hard heart. Well, the Holy Ghost operated. Woo! He showed me that. My, my. It wasn't up here. There's He's a lot of fitting right there. Yeah. My, my, you found a lot about fitting there. Well, I tell you. I said, if, if this changing. little man needs to fit in like that, oh, my, my, how about we of the church of God? If this precious servant feels his health to have a hard heart, I didn't know his heart was hard. I thought he was one of the most sweet and tender men that was energetic and all for God. And I said, if he's got a hard heart, how about all the church? Oh, see, I, didn't, I didn't know I had a hard heart either. I didn't know I had a hard heart. I didn't either. I, I wasn't proud and say, oh, I don't. I, but, no, I, don't. but I didn't really know. But you humbled yourself a I ain't been through the whole sermon, Brother Helm. And when I got up and I said it was worth my coming all the way to Margate, Florida, to hear this sermon, the Holy Ghost hit me with such power in the heart. He was saying, son, you needed this. This was oh, for you. It was oh, worth God. your coming all the way to Florida. Oh, think of it. So I needed that's it. Right, so that's I was right. the one with the hard that's heart. That's right. And I didn't even know it. 
I sat there, I amen, and I didn't know that it, this was really for me. Think of this. Oh, Lord, help the this people to hear. Well, I was the one that needed to hear. Oh, oh, just think. So I wanted, it was life-changing. Oh. It was one of the great that experiences touches my, That operates my in my heart when he said life-changing. Yes. Thank the Lord. The verse that uh, he's just been talking about is where Jesus said in, in Mark chapter 6, verse 52, when Jesus is talking to the apostles and they'd been with him, they had quite an experience on the sea just before this. And uh, he said, For they considered not the miracle of the loaves and fishes, for their heart was hardened. How much does hardness of heart have in the fitting business? It doesn't have any business in it. We've got to get all the hardness out of our heart or we're not going to fit ourselves. It, humility. Now for this servant to say that my heart is hard, he must have possessed a great measure of humility. He had to possess a great lots of childlikeness. Or he would never have said to a congregation, you preach that heart, that sermon to me, to my heart, because I could see why you preached that my heart was hard. And see here he has been testifying and preaching and working and laboring and praying. And yet he sensed and knew his heart. How hard can a heart be with us, without us finding it out? How can we find out how hard our hearts are? It's, Jesus said here that their heart was yet hardened. These 12 men that saw all these miracles. All these men that saw miracles and preached and saw marvels and it said their heart was hardened. Now I want you to know the hard heart can't fit. See when there's a slightest bit of hardness. Do you know what causes hardness of heart? Oh, there's many. That's, that's a volume. I just must not. This, I'll hit a point or two if I can. What causes our heart to be hard is that we didn't obey the Holy Spirit, when he told us to testify, and self came in and said, you just keep quiet. And we received hardness of heart. See, every one of us that does not testify and witness for Jesus at each opportunity, we have a hard heart. Jesus, help us, help us, Jesus. If we don't witness, he said they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Do you remember that scripture? So hardness of heart does not allow you to witness. Now, please love me now. Because, see, uh, if we don't witness, it's because we don't have any victory. And if we don't have any victory, it's because we left the fitting business. We forsook the fitting business. That's why we don't have any joy. You take somebody's dry, you know, and they get up and they talk a little bit, and it's just like a dry bone. But if they've got the joy of the Lord and they've repented and they've made restitution, they said, my heart's hard. And they get up there and God takes that hardness out and they get joy. Oh, glory to God. I tell you, they're like lights in the world. The fitting business doesn't have any hardness in it. Hardness of heart cannot be in it. If we fail to witness, we're cold and we're hard-hearted. If we don't witness in humility, we don't have to say but three words. I love Jesus. Or Jesus just saved me. Yeah. Or Jesus has helped me. Yeah. That's a testimony. We don't have to make any talks. But when we fail to witness for Jesus in, in uh, most any place, if we fail to witness, our heart will get hard and we would have failed denying self. Every time we don't witness, we have failed in denying self. And every man and woman when, they, when we do not deny self at the moment after conversion to give God the praise for saving us through the blood of Jesus, that moment that we do not do that, then we're disobedient. Yes, sir. See, self doesn't want us to witness. Self didn't want a doctor to get up in that church and cry. Mm -hmm. The self and him didn't want to do it, but he persevered on. Yes. He persevered on in humility and was weeping, a medical doctor in the church here. But the self in him had to be denied before he obeyed. Right. You had to really press up because what people are going to think of a medical doctor weeping. 
How much death does that require to self? He's, uh, he's in the fitting business in testimony. He's getting himself fit for the sky because the Lord is telling him he needs to witness and praise him. But he's a medical doctor and the self in there says, now you can just be quiet now. You do a lot to help people, which he does. And so you can just kind of keep it to yourself. You don't have to tell them about Jesus in your testimony. But the Holy Spirit says, get up and witness. We're in the fitting business. He, he was working on getting fit for the sky. Oh, I'm a debt to the Lord for that. Doctor, for that help of the Holy Spirit. Glory to God. Boy, you're in a good church. Just think, it's fitting our soul for the sky. But their heart was hardened. Now, I want you to see that when the heart is hardened, when the heart has the slightest bit of hardness, you listen to the self-assertive life. Not to the self-denying life. When we do not pray when we ought to pray. When we do not testify at every opportunity. See, we overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, the Bible says. And, and if we fail this, we get out of the fitting business. We've already resigned from the fitting business. I never thought about resi resignation is the, the lack, you see, getting out of the fitting business. Most people that's been born since Adam has resigned from the fitting business, getting themselves ready for eternity. That's a big thought, isn't it? That's an immense thought, a giant thought in such a little place. So we see here that getting ourselves fit for the sky means that we are to witness after conversion. Because if we don't witness we dry up. We wither up. See, my soul would be happy this morning if by his grace I, I, I've been witnessing and sharing and the Lord would have mercy on my soul so I could be here this morning to get, it, to get the idea over that we're in the fitting business. When do we fit? When are we preparing every breath Every heartbeat from morning to night, we're in the fitting business, getting it fit for the sky. By conviction, by repentance, by the new birth. These are elements in the fitting business. Just think of it. How important it is to get our hearts fit for the sky, our soul, our inner being ready to go when Jesus comes. And he's coming Soon. Yes. No one knows when that is. Yes. Nobody. Only God himself. So we see here that their hearts of the precious apostles were hardened. And uh, Jesus was, uh, I believe he was very concerned about it. Because uh, turn over from the 6th chapter of Mark to the 8th chapter of Mark. Now, uh, he said then, verse 52 in the 6th chapter, about their hearts being hardened. And then in the 17th verse of the 8th chapter of Mark, it says here, And when Jesus knew it, he said to them, Why reason ye these things? Because ye have no bread. Perceive ye not, yet neither understand, have ye your heart yet hardened. That's verse 17 of the 8th chapter of Luke. They're recognizing again that their heart is yet hardened. And he had already mentioned this to them. And how hard can a heart be? How little of a tinge of hardness of heart can get in the heart and us know it's there? How many people do you think in the church knows their heart is hardened? Any church and every church. How many of our hearts get hardened? Do you know, has there been ever many hearts since the fall of Adam that has maintained to fit into God's will and escape hardness of heart? How is the escape of hardness of heart? Oh, well, praise the Lord, the escape is, is to be what Jesus said 
over here in the 18th chapter of Matthew. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18. It has a marvelous word concerning what we're to do to escape hardness of heart. Jesus said, I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. We escape hardness of heart by becoming like little children after conversion. See, he said that after you're converted, we must become like little children or a little child. And that little child has to learn to walk, learn to talk. He can't feed himself. He can't dress himself. He can't bathe himself. He can't get in bed or get out by himself. He can't get in the high chair by himself. He can't get out. It's utter dependence. Now, when we're utterly dependent upon the Lord, that will help us to escape hardness of heart. If we, with all of our heart, will be utterly dependent upon him and obey him and witness and testify and pray and yield ourselves unto God, there's a lot of yielding us ourselves unto God in this fitting business. Yes, sir. And I tell you, whenever we leave the place of becoming utterly dependent upon the Lord, we're out of the fitting business. Yes, sir. See, there must be in me a pressing. How much pressing does it require to be utterly dependent upon the Lord? Do always his will. How much do I have to die to do God's will instead of my own? I came in Thursday afternoon. I wanted to turn the television on to see Dallas and Dolphins play. And it, the Lord said, pray. So I had to deny myself. So I said, Jesus is my burden for the lost, for the conversion of sinners. And what I said is my burden for the sanctification of believers. He said, your burden right now. I'm not supposed to wash Dallas, Dallas and the Dolphins. But right now, my burden is for the sanctification of believers. See, that's what operated in my heart. Isn't that wonderful? He said, so we have to deny ourselves of this and this and this until God leads us farther on. So I pled with God that through the truth of Jesus, Jesus said in the 17th chapter of St. John, you want to turn over there? To the 17th chapter of St. John. Jesus said over there in verse 17, verse 16, I'd rather read that there also. They are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. He's speaking about his apostles, his followers. He said, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. As that sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Verse 19 says, and for their sakes, that's you and me and all the apostles and disciples. He said, for our sakes, Jesus sanctified himself. He said, I sanctify myself. He's already perfect. He's already without sin. But he said, I'm going to sanctify myself that we also might be sanctified to the truth. So I said, Jesus, uh, before I could look at the, that game, I said, oh, Lord, sanctify them to thy truth. Thy word is truth and thou art the truth. Oh, it touches my heart. Go to those dear ones for whom I'm praying somewhere in the world that they'll be sanctified in their hearts, the believers. And then, you see, I, I, I got the wonderful place there. Someone, we were talking to somebody, and I said, Jesus, where were these believers? Are they in North America for this particular burden? Are they in South America? And when I said Africa, he said, the believers you just prayed for are in Africa. I said, Lord, are they in the uh, southern part, the eastern part, the western part? And I didn't get any words, so I said the northern part. When I said the northern part of Africa, I was praying then for those saints in northern Africa to be sanctified. Well, that touches me right now. It operates with me in my heart. Isn't that great? It's beyond all things of earth. I didn't know anything. All I knew was that God was merciful, so he was having me to pray for the saints there to be sanctified, to be cleansed of this hardness of heart, which prevents us from fitting ourselves for the sky. And then, uh, I can't remember what it was, and also I believe that was the burden uh, or the next one, when God had me to pray for the conversion of sinners, I was going to do something, he said, pray. And uh, it's within me. Yes. 
And that was for the conversion of sinners. Either the one of uh, sanctification of believers or the conversion of sinners, when I prayed on, uh, they were those in six islands and in the Far East. No, I was trying to get fit for the sky by waiting and trying and striving and praying and endeavoring. So be encouraged. You're in the fitting business. You're getting it fit for the sky, the inner life, the inner trust. And he said, I sanctify them that they might be what? One. Let's read a little more. Neither pray I for these alone to be sanctified, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Verse 20. That they all may be one. That's why he said we need to be a sanctified people, cleansed from this carnal nature. See, every man and woman's got a carnal spirit in them. What they wouldn't say, they say. What they would not do that they ought to do, well, they don't do it when they should do it. Carnality is like that. It keeps us out of the fitting business. It prevents us from the fitting business. And Jesus said, I want them to be sanctified to the truth that all my followers may be one as the Father art in me and I in thee. See, he, he's trying to get us fit so that we can become one and harmony, togetherness, in unity. You see, with Brother Morgan and I, here we've been together now 44 years next April, and he and I have had such great fellowship, and there's been unity and harmony. There's never been a conflict by God's grace. And when God told me that morning on February the 1st, 20 years ago, he revealed to me, I couldn't sleep, it was 3.30 in the morning. And I began to try to pray, and I prayed and prayed and cried and cried and prayed and cried, and I couldn't. I couldn't get anywhere much for about an hour or two. And all at once, then the Lord began to show me that he's, he's lonely. He couldn't go to a parsonage to preach because Dorothy was dead. And he couldn't go to the parsonage and live there because when the pastor left, he'd have to get out of the house. And my burden then was for him to have a companion. And he's one of the most backward, shy men that I know. And he wouldn't ask any lady about just a, a little appointment, you know, being together because he's so shy. So I said, Jesus, where's Reverend Morgan's companion? I said, he and I are close brothers. We've never had one conflict in all the years. And I said, now Dorothy's been in heaven now. She was a great saint. One time we were going, she and myself, help me to remember all this, where I was then. <laughs> Uh, Reverend Mrs. Morgan and William and son John <clears throat> and Emery, your father, and uh, David Lee, there were seven of us. And uh, David had to sit on the knees of the men in the back seat for 600 miles. Did you ever have to sit on knees for 600 miles, a little over? It's not very comfortable. But there wasn't any seat for him, so I had to sit on their knees taking turns. And uh, the power of the Lord was in the car so sweetly that Dorothy said to me after about two or three days, she said, Reverend Helm, let's get a big bus, fill it with our people, and take all of the United States what's in this car. <laughs> she, said, she said, the Holy Spirit fellowship, it's in this car, let's just take it all over the United States. See, that's uh, 25 years ago. David was 12 years old, and he's 37 now. That's our grandson that sits right over there, you know. He's not here this morning. He and his, his wife is with their family in West Virginia. And here she said, let's just take all over the United States the presence of the anointing of God that's in this car. Now she's in heaven. She's dead. And I'm praying that early morning, February the 1st, 20 years ago. Oh, Lord, where is Reverend Morgan's precious companion? Where is she? Well, I, I came to this saint, and this saint, and this saint, and this saint, and that saint, and that saint. And uh, when I got to Parisburg, Virginia, oh, touched my heart. I was coming close to where his companion lived. Of all the United States, <clears throat> just think, I couldn't find the witness down in southern Indiana where the great saints live. Another great saint lives right over here, about 45, 45. Two miles, wasn't any witness on this 
precious saint being his companion. Well, when I got into Parisburg, Virginia, and I got, had the witness in my heart that his, his companion was there. <laughs> Just think of it. I didn't know it. I didn't know it was going to happen. <laughs> but Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. Maybe if you haven't read that scripture recently, would you turn to St. John 16, 13? St. John 16, 13. Have you got it? Yes, sir. Would you read it real loud? How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. What? All truth. All truth? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> right on. Thank you. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. Now here I am, I'm trying to pray and he's come to show me something, to reveal something to me. Because when the Holy Spirit dwells us, he shows us what's going on. Just like 45 to 50 minutes before John F. Kennedy was killed, I was in the foyer of the home and a great burden came upon my heart of death. And I said to my wife, I said, there's someone that's near death and it's terrible, it's awful. Back just a few months before he was elected, he came through Yorktown, and I was at that little filling station just out the edge of Muncie where it says there, uh, that man he stood about that tall. He said, if you can't stop, smile as you go by. And I was in there with my wife, and I looked up, and there was John F. Kennedy coming in a convertible, sitting up high. And the instant I saw him, I said, oh, honey, I'm so burdened about this man. The man checking my oil, he said, Reverend Helm, what does that mean? I said, you'll find out one of these days. See, he was telling me, when I saw him, the Holy Spirit in me told me about the situations of his life. And that he would be elected President of the United States and then be assassinated. And here you see then that on the 22nd day of November, I had the burden of his death 30 years ago. And when I turned the radio on and they said John F. Kennedy was just killed and shot in Dallas, my wife came up over the seat and she said, it can't be. We were in shock. I said, honey, that's the burden I've had. The Holy Ghost has been telling me now all this time, clear back here, about his death. Now, the Holy Spirit, that was just by God's grace that this could be done. Because I'll never know anything again, only through Jesus but if the Holy Spirit were to guide and let me know, I would be thankful. I would praise him. I would give him the glory. And so here was Reverend Morgan without a companion, and I'm crying out for him, and I get to Parisburg, Virginia. I found there a praying saint, a woman of prayer who teaches about prayer, who prays. And when I got to her, I didn't get any witness. There was no operation in my heart for this great prayer warrior. Then I came over to this maiden lady, 47 years of age, that never had known man in her life, that had me pray with her six years before that. And she said, Brother and help, I want you to pray to see if I can leave my job. And the Lord said, no. She said, I want you to pray for me about if I can just, uh, about my trailer. And the Lord told me what to do. And I hadn't talked to her Barbara Spangler for those years and she thought I'd forgot her. A handmaid of God, a pure woman that sought to fit herself for the sky. She had been in that kind of business. Religious. Spirit filled. Spirit led. Wanting to do God's will. And when I got to Barbara Spangler, 47 years of age. Now, see Reverend Morgan lived with his wife for 33 years before she died. And here he, here he is about to be told by a servant that his wife was Barbara Spangler. <laughs> oh, what a what an assignment! What an assignment! I'm talking about revelation. This is all fitting us to do God's will. And I said to him when I talked with him that morning, I said, "The Lord has revealed to me who your companion is," and he just laughed and he laughed and he laughed and he laughed. I'm glad he didn't frown. 
He laughed and he laughed and he laughed. You know, he doesn't laugh a great deal, but oh, that laughter that he has is remarkable, isn't it? It really is. And I said, I found her. Jesus has told me who she is. He says, is that right? He always said to me, is that right? Is that right? Do, do you talk about it? Is that right when people tell you something? See, a lot of people do. A lot of people will say, I'll, I'll tell you what. About every little bit, I'll tell you what. A little, every little bit, I'll tell you what. Is that right? <laughs> so I said, Jesus has helped me to find your companion. And I didn't know I was going to have that tremendous responsibility and privilege. I, I didn't seek that one. But I was in earnest about it because I wanted my dear brother to have a companion that could help him and love him and be with him. Because when she's with him and they're in a parsonage and the husband leaves, there's no worry at all. You see, uh, a minister of God can't be in a house uh, with a wife and her husband gone. It's, it's dangerous, can't be. Unless you have your daughter with you or your wife or your son or your brother or a servant of God with you. And then you can be in the home to have prayer with her. You can't spend any time in a home if the husband isn't there because it causes difficulty. See, all through the years, clear back uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, the Lord taught me when I heard Boney Fleming and the minister said to him there in Cincinnati, that went on to God's Bible School Church, he said to uh, Bona Fleming, one of the great preachers, he said, Bona, now I've got to go to meeting and you bring my wife down to church. Well, he said, my dear brother, she's a woman of purity and holiness. And, and I'm seeking the kingdom of God. But you see, Pastor, as much as I love you and your wife, I couldn't take your wife in the car with me down to that church without you. Because if a drunkard were to hit me to come out on the inquire, evangelist out with pastor's wife and wreck things and ruin lives forever. See, a man cannot take in his car any woman unless it's his wife, his daughter, or his mother or a relative. See, we can't do it. I didn't know. I'd, I'd never had it, uh, but I learned that uh, about uh, almost 50 years ago. So I've been preaching just like I preach that we've got to be careful what we do to children because David Lee was with me in the prayer room over here. And before long, he said, hey, man, I was gone maybe in Texas or South Carolina and they'd take him to church, you know, and the pastor would be preaching and he'd say, hey, man, everybody all over the auditorium wondered who that was. He didn't know any better and say, hey, man, every once in a while. He was about to, he was about like Gideon. Because he was with me and I said amen so much in prayer, he thought he'd say amen too. And so if the pastor said something good, he'd say amen. Can any of you remember when he did that? Yes, sir. See, that was uh, 36 and a half years ago. It's about 30, yes. So he always, always said amen. And my father had his parishioners from Logansport Methodist Church there at the house right down the street here at 358. And he said, Oliver Hand, one of the most wonderful men, he said, would you lead us in the prayer of grace over this table? And he did. And when he said, amen, our little David said, amen. And everybody in the room laughed and they laughed and they laughed. <coughs> Not because it was funny, but because they were just stirred by it. But he didn't know that. So when I came back from Texas or South Carolina, and every time I said amen, he laughed and he laughed and he laughed and he laughed. See how we spoil children? Mm -hmm. See, he was robbed, he was cheated there, and yes. they didn't even know they were doing it. Right. See, in this fitting business, we do some things we don't know what we're doing. Right. We don't mean to. See, you've got to hold yourself with children and not laugh at them. Right. Or we'll rob them, we'll cheat them. That's not in the fitting business. That's in the destroying business. That's the opposite of fitting. The opposite of fitting, what is that? Fitted for the sky. And so I said to Reverend Morgan, I said, I have found her in Parisburg, Virginia. And I told him who it was, and he just laughed, oh, he laughed beautifully for, for peace. 
It was a laughter of appreciation. It was a laughter of appreciation. He said, oh, Reverend Helm, she is a saint. She, my wife, were close sisters. I never thought about it. I said, Jesus has told me that Barbara Spangler is your, is your companion. And he just said, that is wonderful. <sighs> Talking about getting him fit for companion. And I, I called her. And I said to her, <clears throat> Barbara, she said, Reverend Helm, I thought you had forgotten me. I said, no, you're not forgotten. <laughs> and I shared with her a while. And after I shared with her a little while, I said, I have something to tell you. Are you ready? She said, my heart's throbbing like awful hard, but I think I can take it. <laughs> She's getting ready, getting fit for the declaration, the announcement. Now, this seldom ever happened. I said, Barbara Spangler, the Lord has revealed to me in the, by the Holy Ghost that you are the wife of Robert Morgan. See, I, I'm a little thrilled right now. This is 20 years ago last February. And she said, oh, Reverend Helm, I'm not worthy. What kind of a heart is that? It's a heart of humility, yeah. a heart of childlikeness, isn't yes. it? That touches my heart. She says, I'm not worthy. So she had a heart of humility and childlikeness. Now, uh, people uh, that are far from God would have resented me telling them. Said it was none of my business. And I should not impose upon them my revelation. Is that true? Yes. And she said, Oh, I just feel he's such a precious man of God. I just feel so humble. I said, oh, my dear sister, precious one, you are the companion of one of the most wonderful, humble, spirit-filled, childlike men in the ministry. And I told him about it. And so I had him to drive down to Parisburg, Virginia, during that week, and he went to a motel. I'm talking about getting him fit for helper, a helper, helpmate. Yes, sir. And he drove down there, and the evening when she got off of work, he took her to dinner. He, he had never hardly talked to her. And they would discuss many things of the kingdom of God and how the Lord led here and how God guided there. So when they'd get home, I'd call them. And they'd get the phone in between their ears up like that. And I asked God to come down in the Holy Ghost and put his arm around them and unite them and marry them. And while I was praying over the telephone, they said they felt the power come down all around each one of them. They just come all around. They had just one receiver. And the power, they said, came all around them and began to fit them to be together. I want you to know they began to fit them to be together. She had never had man. She'd never had a man in her life. And here's a servant of God, his wife, 33 years married, and she's gone. And here he is, and God's helping us to pray by the Holy Ghost, and they get fit together. They're fitting together. But the Holy Spirit, they said they were blessed. Does this encourage you? See, this is a miracle that God would tell a little nothing servant like me who his companion was, a man that wouldn't even ask a woman for a date. Can you tell this is true? Yes, sir. And so they do that every night. And they came up and we met them, Oliver's and, and you and your wife. Yes. Springfield, Ohio. Right. And we got in the room where they were, their room. And I started to go to dinner and couldn't get out. Do you remember? Yes. Had to deny self. I tried to get us to the door, all the couples with me. Was Oliver and Barbara with us too? And you and Janet? Yes. There's four of us, four couples. I tried to get out, and the Lord said, pray. Do you know what he had me to do? He had me to pray for their bodies. He had me to pray for different things that was wrong in their body. One of them was a cancer. He, I just got the burden of cancer then. See, this was 20 years ago, last February. Just the instant right then he gave me the burden of cancer, doctor. I prayed for Barbara's situation. I prayed for Robert's body. 
See, I was going to get out, but I had to deny myself. I had to not go the way I thought. Was that important in the fitting of this? See, he wants to lead us. But don't be discouraged if we'll obey God every time and we'll testify when we can and we'll die sufficiently, he'll begin to reveal himself to us. See, we can't get this by pressing. We only get this by dying. See, I have to die out to myself from morning to night. St. Paul said, I've got to die. You see, dying every minute of your life after conversion is fitting us for the sky. See, I have to die out. I can't do what I want to do. If I did, you see, what would happen? I wouldn't receive a revelation. It would be by the mercy of God that I ever would be privileged again to have a revelation. And so he didn't have to talk to her to give her the background. God helped us to share with both of them. I put it on tape, so uh, I'm a little ahead of my story or behind. I put it on tape, son John did, so that I could play this to uh, Brother Morgan so he wouldn't be too, uh, you know, kind of thinking him going down there. Uh, he could hear what she said. See, I, I had this tape all so he could, he could hear me tell her about her being his companion and her reaction. She could hear her voice of humility, of acceptance, of love, and, and saying, thank you. I'm not worthy of being his companion. Oh, their reactions. See, if, See, I'm she's sorry, saying, I, that's I just, you just help, I just, you're helping well, me. I just you're say, helping me. I, to, to have such a revelation of this and what's all behind it and the fitting, uh, the fitting that was behind getting the revelation, then having the courage to share it and the wisdom to know how to do it and their reception of it there because they were being fitted. I'm telling you, it's, it's just so great. Oh, I'm so thankful. I thank that's the helping Lord. me every Praise time you God. say something, it helps oh, me. Praise the Lord. We're sanctified in Jesus' name. Praise, Praise the Lord. God. So here we are trying to get out of a room we can't. I have to deny myself. Now, if we don't deny ourselves every step of the way, then we are living the life of self-assertiveness and self-planning, and that's a life of disobedience. Now, God does not give his revelation to any disobedient heart. He, he doesn't give his, his revelation to, to a disobedient spirit. He gives his revelation to the childlike and to the humble, those that give him all the glory and all the praise and all the honor for everything and love everybody with all their heart. Do you think God would give a revelation to someone that had talked about somebody? No, violate the law of spiritual truth and love. See, if I were to judge anyone to my wife, if I would make one judgment about any person to my wife, well, they ought to do this and they shouldn't have done that, Right then, I would have entered into the disobedient life of darkness. Yes, sir. After my baptism in the Holy Ghost 50 years ago, 51 years ago, April the 14th, he shared with me that I should never judge anyone to my wife again. I should never complain to my wife any time again. I should never murmur any time again. Do you know that God's really going to judge all the murmurs? What verse is that in Jude that talks about that? It's something. But he told me that I should never again find fault or criticize anybody. Because Jesus said, judge not. And when any of us talk about anybody and make a judgment, we have then disobeyed God and we live in disobedience. See, if we can get all of our church people saved and cleared with God and get all the restitution made, then the power will fall. The power of the kingdom will come down if we'll get everything under the blood. But we've got to be cleansed of this, of this finding fault spirit. Of this, that comes out of the carnal mind. See, if that's not cleansed out of me, I would find fault to you about somebody. And we've been together here for 21 years or two. And see, he has shown me never to find fault about anybody or complain about anybody or murmur about anybody or judge anybody. Because it's of the scriptures. It's of the word of God. And we want to thank Jesus that he, well, we're, well, I'm supposed to get stopped because they're coming, aren't they? We've got to tear down. I'm not near through. I'm, I'm not through. <laughs> Help me, Jesus. How am I going to get to this fitting business this soon? <laughs> Praise the Lord. And you know, we prayed 
And then the next day we had breakfast. At the breakfast table, Barbara Spangler said to me, Reverend Elm, I want to tell you something. Six weeks or eight before you call me, I was somewhere by myself, and it came right inside of me. You are the wife of Robert. Times that she was the wife of Robert Morgan before I ever got the revelation, or after I got it. No, we didn't feel badly then, did we? No one felt pressed then, did we? She already knew it three times before I told her. And God told, uh, revealed it to me. And after about a week or two after they were married and they were talking about making adjustments. See, most all couples have to make adjustments. We've been together 61 years this next point. And Fortson and I have to make adjustments every little bit. Every few days. Uh, all you couples, all you couples here, do you, know, do you make adjustments with your couples, all of you? Sure, you have to. Unless one is dominating the other and crushing them. See, you take a husband or a wife, if they make the decision, it's got to be my way, they're crushed. They've crushed their companion. Every man and every woman, that it's got to be their way. They have crushed their companion. That's me or anybody else who does it. Oh, see, it crushes. A lot of wives are crushed by their husbands. I didn't know there was so much abuse. I didn't know it was in the world until recently. It got on the TV and the newspapers. In the last few years, I learned. I didn't know about it. I didn't know it occurred. It's not in the fitting business. Yes, it is. It's fitting to live together in the family in harmony. If we don't fit ourselves, then we hurt one another. Instead of fitting, we're hurting. You see, most people in the hurting business rather than the fitting business. Most people are in the disobedience uh, business rather than the fitting and obedience business. Oh, well, did I rejoice when she told me that that had been like that. Yes. Praise the Lord. Now I've got to leave all this and I've got to go on to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. 14, verse 33. This is all in the fitting business, and I can't get it to all of it, but it's chapter 14 of Luke's writings. Chapter verse 14, uh, verse 33. Yes. Verse 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that's you and me and everybody else, whosoever it be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. So that's in the fitting business. Unless I, unless I forsake all, I cannot begin to get things fit together. Just think what that means to all church people. If we don't forsake all, well, then we're not in the fitting business. We're fitting for our own likes. Now in verse 27, here's another part of the fitting business. And whosoever doth not bear his cross, that's verse 27 of the 14th chapter of Luke. Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. Well, they preach on TV that if you just repent, give your heart to Jesus, you have eternal life. All these things that are in the scriptures, well, you see, it's in the fitting business. He said, whosoever doth not bear his cross, that's the inner death, the sanctifying life. Whosoever it be of us who does not bear our cross, that's the inner crucifixion, and come after Jesus, he said, he cannot be my disciple. Why isn't it preached all over the, the place? And now in Mark 8 or 9, chapter, Mark 8 and 9, I have to go fast here because they're coming in here. We've got to tear down. And Jesus said, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself. Verse 34. He said, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So I can see the fitting business is mostly self-denial. In the fitting business, it's mostly self-denial because self is the first thing that has to be denied before we ever do what Jesus wants us to do in witnessing or whatever he tells us to do. He told me up there at Ned's store all at once to get down here, right here, to pray for that dear man. He had a, they found a growth in him about that big. And I was just there in Ned's store buying something. And the Holy Ghost, I just had to run. And I ran down there and I went in there. 
he lived right next to where Moses used to live on the north side. He was, he was a religious man. And I commanded in Jesus' name that growth to leave his body. And uh, the Lord, they took him to Indianapolis, you know, to open up his uh, stomach uh, to find out uh, this growth and to remove it. And uh, they took another x-ray. And all the doctors came in his room, about seven of them. They came all around his bed and they said, listen, we have the x-rays of this terrible growth in your abdomen. And we, we took the x-ray when you came to get it taken out. And we want to ask you what the name of the surgeon was that did this because we can't find a scar in your stomach. I was down here at the store right there on the corner across from Thurwood's garage. And God said, you go down and pray for him. And I ran in there and I said, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, behold, yes. and left. Yes. And when they went to have it removed and they took, the, they took another x-ray, it was gone. And they wanted to know how the, how the uh, surgeon took it out without making any mark on him. All of them, all seven of those doctors said, how did you get that out of you? Well, Jesus of Nazareth took it out of him. Uh, but he revealed it up there. But how many hundred times did I have to deny self before the revelation ever came to me? Yes. It's by the grace of God I could do it again. You have to pray for me because I'm weak. I'm weak. We must deny ourselves every, every moment or we'll not have revelation. It's by his grace it could ever be again. See, I, it'll be by his mercies that I can make it to heaven through the blood of Jesus Christ. But he said, unless we deny ourselves, he said, we cannot. We cannot. If any man's going to come after me, let him deny himself. And I am convinced that there's very few people know what I'm talking about. People that's read the Bible for 40 and 50 years. And we don't know what self-denial is. We don't know what denying ourselves is. See, this is tragic when we get to the judgment. See, where all the church people will be there, and he, uh, the first thing is going to be whether we've denied ourselves after we accepted Christ and, and have done it faithfully always after that. No wonder Jesus uh, laid it on my heart 61 years ago in the next two months and only a few is finding this light. The Bible said only a few will find it. How many remember that scripture? Who, who does not remember the scripture? That uh, few will find it. Is there anyone here that does not remember where that scripture is or know it? Jesus said in the seventh chapter of Matthew, verse 14, and few there be that find it. We're talking about fitting for the sky, getting our souls ready. So self denial, you see, is a big part of this. If a man's going to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That means leaving all, forsaking all. That's uh, repentance. That's obedience. That's testimony. Uh, he, whosoever will save his life. Everyone that's failed and has reneged from the life of self-denial is saving his life. Most all men and women on earth are working to save their life. He said, he that will save his life, that's verse 35. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And we, we save our lives by making the plans and arranging things in ourselves. And uh, just kind of doing it the way we want it. See, we're, we're saving our life by planning, by arranging, without the leading of the Holy Spirit. See, we need the leading of the Holy Spirit. I do, we all do. And it says there, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel, the same shall find it, save it. Everyone that denies self every moment, every hour, and is obedient and keeps childlike and, and don't press people, but love people. Not pressing anyone. Not making people in a strain. See, the Lord don't want us to do that. The self-denying life will not do that. The self-assertive life will put pressure on you and require things of you. The person who denies self don't press you. The person who denies self is just willing to do whatever God says, and there's hardly anyone that's willing to do it. This is all fitting ourselves for the sky. I'm going to have to quit because the time says they're coming in here and we don't want to disappoint them. A charge to keep we have, a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save, and fit it. 
All this I preached about this morning is talking about fitting it, making adjustments, getting ready, getting everything together, fitting it for the sky. Here I preached for almost 61 years, and he gave me this sermon this week on fit it. A while back was suffer, would, uh, but God to suffer thee, to guide thee. If thou would but suffer God to guide thee, and now here he gives me a sermon, by the grace of God, I don't know how to preach. I don't know how to pray. And he'd allow me here a message on fit it for the sky. Please don't let this leave you. Now I want you to know that hardly, I, do you think that there's three people in here that's heard me in their heart this morning? Do you think there's three or four or five that's in this auditorium that's heard me in their heart? I used to preach maybe 30 years ago and my wife and I said, oh Jesus, how many people heard me tonight? There'd be two out of the congregation that could hear in their heart because of hardness of heart and because of analyzation. Trying to get the summary. Trying to find out why, how come. See, that kind of a heart will never get God's will. The heart of analyzation will never. A uh, person that analyzes, right then, you see, is living in the self-assertive life. See, we had to follow and we had to forsake all and not analyze. Just, just follow and do his will and be careful so we don't become fanatics or radical or oppress anyone or hurt anyone or speak words that would be something that would hurt somebody. Put pressure on them. In Jesus' name we pray that thou will take each one of our hearts and help us to get this message inside of us so that we will not forget that we're fitting every moment, every hour. We're fitting ourselves for the sky every day by our praying, by our scripture reading. If we do not read the scriptures, we're not going to be fit for the sky. If we don't meditate on the scriptures, we're not going to be fit on the sky. If, you know, I, I believe that we need to have family prayer together in order to fit a family to have harmony. And, and if we don't pray together, then we have trials together that's hard to solve. When we pray together, well, we can pray those terrible things out of us so that we can have harmony in the home and with the children, with our neighbors, and with our enemies. In the name of Jesus, amen. I guess we better stand and be dismissed, hadn't we? Thank you. Anybody that wants Jesus, ask him to come into your heart. He will hear you and forgive you this morning. Let us go rejoicing, bringing in our sheaves. I trust God to help you to uh, reflect and review and rejoice. And thank the Lord. Please, please know that there's much hope. The best is yet ahead. Amen. And God's looking for people that He can trust to come into their lives with the kingdom of God. And God wants you to be one of those people. He wants me to be one of those people. And it can be. Let's start right now. Let's continue right now. Let's go on right now. Let's stay in the becoming. Let's, uh, let's let God fit us in all the areas of our life. I trust God to help this word to find lodging in my heart and soul and in yours. Uh, and God, by the Holy Ghost, can do it. Be thou encouraged. Did you have a word? Stephanie's birthday is Friday. Could we real quick sing happy birthday? Oh, wow, we would be most delighted. Stephanie, honey, would you come up here? John. Pastor John. Who, John? John, Lane, what, John, would you come? Come up here, honey. John, come right up, dear brother. Um, John March was on uh, Thanksgiving Day, and Brother March was the next day, and Thomas Mullins was the next day. Well, you're all... <laughs> Daniel, you've been designated, brother. Come right up here. Sure thankful for the Stutzmans. Holy Ghost told me to go tell them they were a precious family. I want to thank God. Met them in a funeral home and we've had fellowship ever since and i want to thank the lord for that reverend helm thank you for coming and sharing the word we're thankful how god helped you and work he helped boy helped wonderfully praise god amen how you've helped us all these years i want to praise the lord for all of you each one of you has helped yeah everyone thank the lord you've helped us well let's sing happy birthday to these dear ones how old are you dear lady Seven. Praise God. Going to be. be uh, Friday should be eight. All right, let's sing. Happy birthday to you. And to Jesus be true. And to Jesus be true.
the Lord. We're thankful for each of you. Stephanie, thank you for coming up, coming all the way over here from Cincinnati. And that's for you, honey. Thank, thank you. the Lord. All right, let's, let's pray. Remember the service at six o'clock this evening? Be here at all if you can. There's just something about when God's people to get together as a body. You know, when the little finger is, is not there, not functioning, the body's not complete. And so let's do the best we can to always uh, be together. Count that as uh, part of our obligation of being fitted. And it really is. More than we perhaps know. All right, shall we pray? Yes. Thank the Lord. Let's pray for those who are traveling. And uh, we're just believing God for help and protection. So when we leave, now when we're dismissed, would you try to move right on to the cars if you're not helping or try to stay out of the way because if we just stand where we are, it's hard to break, break uh, the room down. And uh, then we'll need help then at 5 o'clock to put things back together. Uh, John, was it your hand? Yes, sir, brother. I feel that we uh, need to ask for prayer for Brother Chuck here. Uh, you know, he hurt his uh, ankle several months ago, and again yeah. yesterday he uh, slid on the ice. And and I really feel that you know we can't lose him. Uh, you know, humanly speaking, he needs rest on that flat leg. So I just praise God. Just lay your hand on him, there, John. Let me. Uh, I want you to pray. Let me come down. Here and anoint with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Jesus, I rebuke the damage here in this ankle. In Jesus' name, we anoint Chuck with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Oh, dear Jesus, you, Jesus, we come to you, O oh Lord, mm. to pray for this man that you have sent us here, O oh God, to yes. help us to build this mm -hmm. house that we mm -hmm. are to worship you in. Mm -hmm. We pray, O oh Lord, for this leg that you would go into Mercy. the bones, to go into the cartilage, O oh Lord, and the nerves, and just touch it, O oh God, and heal it. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would be with him and lift him up, O oh Lord, and strengthen him and guide him and direct him, him O well. oh Lord, in all that he does there on a daily basis. We pray this yes, for in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Be well, behold, for the glory of God. Rebuke it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Brother John. Thank the Lord. Well, let's let's be dismissed in prayer. Poncho, would you pray? We sure love all of you. Jesus loves you most importantly. Jesus, thank you for Here the words that we heard today. Jesus, help our hearts to be soft so that we may take a seed of this wisdom, Jesus, and to find us a place in our hearts that we can understand and appreciate and apply what we learned and heard so that we may lead others as well as our families. Jesus, give us all safe travel this afternoon. Help us bring bring back us bring us back this evening. In your in your name, Jesus. Amen.
Good evening. Good evening. Would you join us in prayer? Let's stand together, please. Amen. Pastor Emery, would you pray for us, please? Surely it is good, O oh Lord, to be in the designated place of uh, where your people are supposed to meet. Thank you, Jesus, that I know where, uh, where I'm supposed to be tonight. Thank you, Lord, that we can know where you want us to be and, and, and when you want us to be there. And uh, we just leave the rest of that to you. If we can be at the right place at the right time, we know that you could, could help us to say or do uh, that which would encourage somebody or, or uplift somebody. Oh, Lord, we ask for your... Uh, continued guidance for this hour and that each heart would be uh, seeking and uh, finding and doing your will. Help those who maybe wanted to be here and were not able. Encourage and uplift them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Find a praise and worship hymnal, if you would, please, and turn with us to uh, 126. When he cometh to make up his jewels... All his jewels, precious jewels, his loved and his own. Like the stars of the morning, his bright crown adorning, they shall shine in their beauty, bright gems for his crown. Oh, what are in the hymns of the church as God works and inspires how the Lord uh, helped Brother Helm this morning with the phrase from, from that song. What, what was the word? Uh, fitted, fitted, fitted. We were talking on the phone the other day and he was just sharing the words of that song and he said, and fitted for the sky. And he said, fit, and, and fit for the sky. And he said, oh, well, he got to talk, talking about fit. He said, now hold that to your heart because I'm going to try to preach that sometime. 
And uh, well, I know it would be Sunday morning here, but God helped him to share it with us, didn't he? Didn't God come and help us from early on? I want to thank God for the Holy Ghost to come. He got in my soul. I felt like he was just moving and working and pulsing in my heart. Felt like I had the kingdom of God. Somebody put the kingdom machine within me. And I just I felt it in there. Oh, somebody turned the motor on and it was moving. I said, glory to God, I'm in a good place here. I thank the Lord for it. For I didn't, I didn't come that way. I come hoping for I came hoping for a motor and I got one. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. You, Gives us wonderful things for our souls. He knows how to feed us. Let's sing this great song. Lee, come and play for us if you would. Thankful for Lynn to play for us. Yes. For Lee. I'm thankful. I don't know how many penis we have, but there's a number. There are a number, and I'm thankful. <laughs> Praise God, Pastor Emery. Thank the Lord. John, come and lead this wonderful song, would you, brother? When he cometh, when he cometh to make up his jewels, all his jewels, precious jewels, his loved and his own. Like the stars of the morning, his bright crown adorning, they shall shine in their beauty, bright gems for his crown. He will gather, he will gather, God. Be seated, please. Thank you. Makes you want to sing some more. I love it. Isn't that wonderful hymn? That is so sweet. That's like singing, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Jesus wants us to be like little children. And I'm trusting God to help me in my heart. You pray for me. And God will be able to, to help me in the becoming. Who has a testimony for the Lord tonight? Amen. I want to thank everyone for loving Stephanie this she morning. She was so sweet, so lovely. I tell you, God helped her. She just got right in on it. I know she it. watched Brother Helm and watched him and watched him and watched him. And when we left the service, she says, Grandma, Reverend Helm is so sweet, and he looks so young for being old. <laughs> she said, how could he be 78? He's so young. She just was so taken with him. Yeah. And it was so good because when he would say the chapter and the verse, she was not satisfied until she looked it up herself. And she just read and read and read. And she read from John 1, 1 John and 2 John yesterday, which was right in that area of truth and love. And she says, Grandma, that's what I read yesterday. Mm. So she just got right in on it. And she also commented about uh, Dr. Reese. She says, Oh, Grandma, his prayer was so sweet. Mm. It helped me in my heart. Grandma. So I am thankful. Praise I God. tell you, this I'm little child too. goes to Catholic school. She's Catholic. Yeah. And she just got right in on it and just was so at home. And I, I just, and surprised over the birthday dollars. She was really surprised because she had no idea 
that we did that. So I want to thank the Lord for how he helps. And when we were praying about Stephanie coming, God showed me that she needed fortified. And that's a wonderful thing is we pray for our children, grandchildren, that God can show us what they need and what needs prayer. And I believe that this child was fortified these four days while she was here. It touches me now that she was fortified through the love of different ones that she was with, Donna June and Chris and Tyler and Becky and Sheree and Jeff and just all the different ones. So I want to praise the Lord for her. She's, um, she's been a precious baby from when she was 12 hours old. So I, I'm just thankful how God has, has helped. Praise the Lord. Amen. Remember how you overcome. Uh, Brother Helm had a lot to say about that this morning, well, encouraging one, us. There was one other thing I forgot to say. I said, Stephanie, uh, tell your mommy what Reverend Helm said. And she thought about because he said a bunch. But she turned and she said, Mommy, Reverend Helm says that disobedience is a sin. I said, Praise the Lord. If we get that in our heart, if we can get that in our heart. Now, that is what that child got out of the that service. Was, that was the bottom line of the service. And then she, she did. And she said, she said, Mommy, that means Mommy, Daddy, Grandma, Grandpa, Pastor, and God. Yeah. I thought, Jesus, help me. I need, I'm the one that needy help here. And then she told her mommy several other things that were dear and precious. But disobedience is a sin. And if we <laughs> could all get in on that somehow, and that means bosses, those in authority over us, and whomever that we submit and, and obey. So I, I was thankful. She, she just really got a lot out of it. Lord. Yes, sir, Charles. Rod, get ready to sing, brother. Yes, I want to be thankful. You know, when Brother Morgan was, Brother Morgan, Brother Helm was preaching this morning, and he was talking about being fit, and the first time he mentioned Brother Morgan, the story came to me that he finally told here about how he and Barbara, you know, had no adjustments to make. Because they sat down one night and told me the whole story. And I thought, you know, <laughs> I didn't know whether he's ever going to get that, to that part of the story about, man, here's a couple. You know, their prayer life for years made them fit for one another. And what a, what a tremendous story. And I'm thankful he got that part in because, brother, let me tell you, they were fit for for one another when you don't have any adjustments to make. That's a miracle. That's being on your knees praying for many years. Yes, Thomas. Well, I want to be faithful and try to overcome and give God praise and glory and honor for help and strength and for safety this week. Amen. Thank the Lord. Donna? Well, before you said that, I was sitting here thinking, now Reverend Helm said to get up and just praise the Lord <laughs> before you said that. And so I wanted to get up and be an overcomer and say that Jesus is helping me, and I want to praise him because he's worthy to be praised. He surely is. Thank the Lord. Much of the service revolved around the fact that, what I think is the fact, that if, if someone from the point in time of conversion, and I told told the congregation this morning, for those who weren't able to be here, that uh, I have heard some preaching on self-denial. I've heard some preaching on the cross. I've heard some preaching on the leadership of the Holy Spirit, some preaching on the evidence uh, of love. I've heard some preaching on uh, uh, childlikeness, uh, a little bit in those areas. But I've never heard anyone in my life share what I see as uh, a very central truth in the Christian church. And that is from the time of conversion, from the moment of conversion, when we've said, oh, Jesus, I'm a sinner, forgive me. And whatever words we said that, that is that we would assume true conversion uh, had to be focused in that area. From the moment that, that Jesus came into our heart, 
within about two seconds, the Holy Spirit will say, testify. Will say, say a word for me. Just about every I, I had that experience. Did most of you have that experience? I know my wife had that experience. I didn't know no. Yeah, I didn't have anything to do with a man. That had to do with the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, if you won't confess me before men, I can't confess you before the Father. And, uh, and so one of the most essential things in uh, the, the, the God's use of us in his kingdom, because that's why we we're born, to be used in his kingdom. He said, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Give him the praise and the glory and the honor for all things. So all that we are and all that we uh, have and all that we become is as an ambassador for Jesus Christ. This isn't any new. We've all heard this. But it's awfully good review. And so to become an ambassador means that, that you become the representative and carry the authority to, in a certain way uh, of the one, not ultimate authority, but, but, uh, but an ambassador is authorized uh, to speak for the one who sends him. Therefore, you and I from conversion are an instrument of God. To go further, we are called to be priests and kings. That's a remarkable thing, be a priest and king. Do you know until the time of Jesus Christ, no man was ever qualified, called to be priest and king? You had kings and you had priests, but you didn't have both. But in Jesus, you had priest and king. King of kings and Lord of lords and a priest after the order of Melchizedek who had no beginning and no ending, who even the patriarch Abraham gave gifts unto. And so the, the, the joining of these two offices, godly, divine offices were established in Jesus Christ and they were, as an ambassador, we were given the same kind of calling. Well, all that is to say then that from the moment of conversion, you and I are instruments in the kingdom of God. You're a spokesperson for Jesus. That's one of the most important things. You're not saved to be saved. That's a byproduct. You're saved to be used in the kingdom of God. And uh, which is, and that's not an oh my, that's where all the, that's where the joy of life is. That's where the help of the heart is. I wish I could remember the quote I read one time of, of what Augustine had to say about uh, giving yourself away in the will of God, how it is that that's where real life is. But uh, he said it very beautifully. And I can't remember it, but that's what we were born for. Adam and Eve were made to be used of God, to, to provide fellowship for God and to keep God's world, to keep God's garden. They were to be used in the kingdom of God. And so it is that, uh, that man uh, is, is, from the point of conversion, is an instrument of God. And within a second or two, the Holy Spirit will say, witness for me. If a person does not witness and respond, maybe just to say, Jesus, save me, which is probably adequate. <laughs> But if they don't do that, they are in a state of falling. They are in, they're in a state of disobedience. And it may not be, uh, I don't know how conscious a state of disobedience uh, it is at that point. I, I have to believe that if the Holy Spirit tells you and you don't do it, you have to have some consciousness of it. The, the, the danger is... You may know that you didn't do it, but most people don't know that disobedience is sin and they don't know that they are in the process of turning away from God right in that very moment. And so it is that within a day or two or three days, the joy of the Lord is not sustained in their heart uh, or sometime along the way. And, it, it, and we say, well, what's, what's this all about? I'm going to tell you something, folks. 
If we're not walking in fresh obedience unto the Lord, there is not real joy and victory and, and light and power and love in our hearts. There, there just is not. And I want to tell you, I have a feeling that within some uh, precious, precious people in the kingdom of God, in the churches, in Parker City and, and, and everywhere, I have to believe there are many who have been going through the hollow motions of religion for an awful long time, long ago lost the joy, and just occasionally would get someplace where a little child did something or somebody did something in an emotional way and it made us weep emotionally. We said, oh, glory to God, I've still got it. And that's not at all. That was not the real joy of the Lord. That wasn't the joy of obedience because joy comes by obedience. And if we are not freshly obeying God, which is when he tells us to witness for him. That's one way we obey God. When he tells us what to do, when he tells us how to act, when he tells us what not to do, when he tells us how not to act, those are all obediences. And when we obey, their joy comes up within us. And it's not commensurate with the deed. I wouldn't know the numbers of times that I've done some little thing for the Lord and just the glory that God got in my soul. A big one. Did some little old piddling thing, you know, and you felt like you did some great and wonderful thing. Why? Because God's pleased with it. Oh, he loves obedience. Oh, he's glad whenever he calls you to go to Africa and you go, but he's awful. He's just as happy. Now, now think with me logically. If sin is sin, is that right? There's no difference between little sins and big sins. 